Working Parents Podcast. Cool. Yep. All right, here we go. Coming down three, two. Welcome back for another week of the Working Fans Podcast. This is AJ. I'm the former wrestler. We've got Dave, the ultimate fan, here with us. As we do every week, our producer, Joe, may likes to make us sound good and makes us look way more professional than we actually are. As always, you can find us on Twitter. That's at Fans Working. Facebook, Working Fans Pod. We've got email where you can reach out to us and please contact us to let us know what you think of the podcast and for any ideas that you might have that's working fans wrestling pod at gmail.com we're on instagram where you can keep up with us at working fans wrestling underscore pod and then you can now listen to us on all major platforms including anchor.fm we're on google Podcasts, spotify breaker overcast Pocket Casts, Radio Public, Apple Podcasts, and you can actually check us out on YouTube. Now, it's important when you go onto the Apple Podcasts and YouTube, hit that subscribe button, give us a rating, let us know what you think so you can help us out and we can continue to do what we love and bring you guys in as fans. Dave, this weekend we had the joy of watching some of All Out for me and you were able to watch the whole show. Yeah. Before we kind of go through it, like what are your impressions of the pay-per-view as a whole? It was high. It was, it was their worst effort. I didn't think it was their best effort in terms of pay-per-views and big shows. Pacing was really off. The pacing really dragged. I thought part of that was maybe because I was tired. Because it was Labor Day weekend. I worked a lot. Yeah. But then I got kind of the same response from other people. Mike Flynn had messaged me, and he said, he said, this card is just dragging. He said, a lot of these matches that I would like, don't see these clicking. There was some weird booking decisions. I, there's some good from this show, too. There are some good things that I like that maybe other people wouldn't. I'm, I almost feel weird about the things I actually really like. But I'll mention that as we go on the show. But for the most part, hey, and I'm not sitting on the company. I still love AEW. Dynamite's still great. This just wasn't a solid effort. It didn't happen to work out. Yeah, this is weird. This is almost like, in the whole time that I've been watching AEW, the only thing that I'd be like, ooh, wow, that was not great. I mean, some of like the early Dark Order stuff, like where they got exposed with the hits, wasn't a good look for the company, but I could get over it. This, I mean, there's obviously a couple things that really touched people the wrong way. And like you said, it was just odd pacing. Shit that was going to be on the pre-show got moved to the regular show. Where things were placed on the show, I thought was weird. Yeah, and I'll touch up on a few other things, too. Some of this could have been the heat, you know, and <clears throat> Dynamite was taped once in a while. They were going back and forth. And when you can do that, you have the ability to crowd scoot in a little bit. That wasn't able to happen with a lot of this show. So, Daily Place isn't always the best for sound. It's an open arena. And then the people are really hot. And they were probably, you know, and so it's just hard to say. I mean, this actually, if you go back, one of the people we had fans, Whatever event they had at the always place, it was a good look. Remember, there were people tired that night, too, and they were complaining about the heat. So there's something that happens once in a while at this place. Yeah, I know for me, especially with work, like, Labor Day weekend kicked my ass. I went to a party after work and then right to the pay-per-view. So I caught pretty much all of the undercard. Everything up in the last match I saw was Hikaru Shida versus Thunder Rosa. But let's kind of go through the card and break it down a little bit. One other thing, too. How bizarre is it? Like, WWE just had, like, a decent SummerSlam. Payback was better than expected because there was low expectations going into that. But they came off, like, a counted SmackDown this weekend. How weird is it that we have, like, good WWE feedback and then we're talking about negative AEW feedback? It almost feels bizarre. It's definitely backwards, but we, we'll start talking about the show, and there's <laughs> there'll be a couple <laughs> obvious reasons why this thing went oh, yeah. south. Now, Private Party versus Silver and Reynolds on the pre-show. I It was a perfectly mm. fine pre-show match, but oh, it yeah. was something I could see kicking off the pay-per-view, maybe. Would've it was a good a tag idea. match. Would have been a better idea. Actually, originally, the Super Nail match was going to be on the pre-show. Tony had mentioned that there was some negative feedback. People thought that should have been on the main card. So we ended up getting two additional matches. One we didn't mention, Joey Janela had one again. Sarah Pentico. Sarah Pentico, thank you. And then we had this match, which I thought it would have been a great match to kick off, you're right. And another thing, too, I want to add, I don't, hey, I'm happy the guy's got jobs. You know, I know they're not on the bigger side, but to him at all, I really personally feel like Alex Reynolds, and especially John Silver, 
could do more. Especially in this match, you could see Silver had his working boots on and was busting his ass to get this match over. Everything he did and every bump he took. So this was actually a big positive. I really actually even... I enjoyed this match a lot, I think. Yeah, former guest of the show, John Silver. And if you can see what him and Reynolds did as the Beaver Boys and Beyond Wrestling, it's almost hard to see them as AEW top jobbers almost. I hate to say it, but... No, I'm not saying I mean, I'm still uh, a huge fan of them, and they get their comedy over on being the elite, I hear. Yeah, they do. Yeah, John Silver plays off great with Brody Lee and everybody. Silver's definitely coming up like a star, but Reynolds is great, too. As a team, they're great. And on the Indies, I'll say this, Reynolds was a great deal. Like, people hated that motherfucker when he came out. So, you know, and that's what you wanted to heal, right? So I would say, again, good job in this match. This will be a positive thing. I was very impressed with these guys, if anything. If you want to talk a negative, like you said, this could have opened the car. But that's not a, you know what I mean? Like that's a, that's a compliment to these guys. They did great. Sarah Pentico and Janela, I'd say nothing necessarily that's stood right. out about this match. It was a fine enough pre-show match. Yeah. Could have been a good dark match, but to me, it really wasn't much of, I really wouldn't say much of that. Nothing that stood out, at least. Nothing bad, nothing good. It was just kind of there. It was what it was. It was a good pre-show match. It was fine for what it was. To kick off the show, the cinematic match, Britt Baker versus Big Swole, I really have no problems with this opening the show. I thought it was a good enough cinematic match. <clears throat> it had its comedy. It played off one of the bigger storylines they've had going for a while. It was hokey. However, a lot of these cinematic matches sometimes can be a little hokey. I, I didn't hate it as much as some other people did, but I didn't love it either. I'm not a huge fan of Swole. Nothing against her. I just, you know, I'm not. I think Britt Baker is very charismatic. I love her heel work. Reba plays her silly little part good. That being said, I'm not a but Big Soul has charisma. People do get into it, but you know, there's not really, it's funny, they could sweeten the crowd a little bit in this one, you can tell. But I don't know. It just didn't really click overall for me. I would say it's small negative because I just really enjoyed the match. But it wasn't going to, like, it didn't sour me on the paint to do anything at this point. It was just, you know, to me it was just kind of like, like you said, I would have found a tag match kick this off and this has been on the season. Yeah, and something this pay-per-view seemed to do is give you a good match, then give you maybe a downer or a little bit of a break, and then the match after that was good. And the Bucks versus the Jurassic Express was next, and it's really kind of hard for that to be a bad match. Yeah, no, they did great. They had their working shoes on. The Bucks looked fantastic. I thought they helped get um, Jungle Boy over, who was kicking out a lot of super kicks and stuff. He looked strong. Bucks showing a little bit of edge still. Like they're mad over everything that's going on with Hangman. Yeah, no, I thought solid, good tag match. And again, this could have been a hell of an opener, too. So this was definitely uh, another thumbs up here. True. And now the next match, which I would have expected to be the opener for the show, but it was third in, is the Casino B Battle Royale. And we're not going to break down wave by wave who came in. No. Uh, some of the most notable things are Matt Seidel making his debut and then almost breaking his neck. That yeah. was the first of a couple horrific falls in a row on and this then, show. But one positive thing I said, we'll say this, and then we're going to talk about another bump in the battle royal. But positive thing, Will Hobbs. Happy to see this guy get kind of a push. He performed great in here. He had a presence, and it looks like. This guy might have came from wrestling on Dark and maybe getting involved on Dynamite and being beat a little more. So, happy for him. Yeah, he was big in APW out in California. And it's good to see him get featured in this Battle Royal in a like in a more prominent way. Yeah, and there was one, one other thing. Oh, yeah. So, one other thing I want to talk about, too, is the Darby Allen bomb. Putting him in the uh, body bag, going up with some thumbtack. Kind of filling it up with thumbtacks. Yeah, correct. Everybody was eating place. that shit for the rest of the match. Yeah. Now, I, I understand he's done this before, but boy, that's a tough bump, man. I mean, you know, you can't see where you're landing. And I thought Cage was, I mean, Cage was a pro, but I thought it was, and execution wasn't the best. But I didn't enjoy that. <laughs> you know, I'm glad Harvey's okay, but. No, this is the I most thought. amount of sloppiness I've noticed in, like, a whole event for them. They've had their moments where sloppy things have come out, but, like, between the Matt Side album, then this body bag thumbtack spot. Yeah. And, I mean, I, I'm not a wrestler, so I'm not criticizing them for that, but it's just no. these little things throughout the show that I was like, all right, I'm tired and this shit's going on. Like, what's going to happen next? And we yeah. come to Matt Hardy versus Sammy Guevara, and holy shit. Whoa. <laughs> I will say this, Archer wasn't a bad guy to win. All right. 
Believe it or not, now let's talk about it. Yeah. I was, I was grabbing food, actually, and I was looking away, and then I heard Matt hit his head. <laughs> and I'm watching Matt on the ground, and I see he's, like, got a blank look on his face. You came Matt back for, like, the aftermath, right? Right, like right, right, right after, right after he went through the table and then hit his head. Like I yep. literally came right. I watched, started watching like right after. Now, how weird was it to come back in the room and have nothing going on on the TV for several minutes? Well, what's weird was too is you could see he was trying to get up. He didn't have his legs about him, and you start wondering like, is this part of the match? What the fuck is happening? You see Aubrey doesn't know what like, he knows what to do. He he stops the match, which we understand later. Tony kind of told her, and I'm not criticizing Aubrey, that's a situation like you don't know what they're going to do sometimes. At the end of the day, she did call it, whether it was to the Tony or not, and good on her. That was that was good at that point, right? Right? We They took a bad bump and we needed to stop this mess at that point. We didn't do that. <laughs> no, <laughs> it continued from there, and I mean, yeah. there's been a lot of news this weekend about should they have done it? Like, this is the stuff yeah. that the WWE gets criticized for. Oh, yeah. I think... Yeah, I think Mike, Flynn, Mike Flynn said that. He said, you know, if WWE had done this, people would have riot, but it would not have been, you know, acceptable. I think even fans that are fans of AEW right now are a little upset over this, and I don't know, like, they, I feel like the match probably should have been stopped, but if... Oh, yeah. It, he should have definitely been climbing the scaffold. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But knowing Hardy, it's almost like, or just knowing wrestlers in general, how they want to push through and make things happen, I think it'll open a bigger discussion on when something should, like somebody should step in and make a decision to stop that and not yeah, let it go weird, forward. It's a weird thing. I've heard a lot of back and forth about it. Like this happens in the UFC, which obviously is a combat sport, where a doctor will come in or they'll ask them sometimes, "Are you good to go?" And the fighter and even the pro wrestler will almost say, "Yep." <laughs> you know, and it's like the doc, which I guess was the concussion, concussion protocol. It was basically Dr. Sampson going, You feel good to go? You know, he might have asked him what day it was or whatever. And yeah, okay, fine, let him go. Yeah, because in fighting, uh, isn't it your like ability to defend yourself that it's really the cutoff right. point for when the match gets stopped? Right. And now, granted, fighting is more dangerous, yes. But to counterpoint that, in the, uh, you don't try to climb the scaffold after that either. <laughs> no, exactly. And I mean, yeah. if if he's barely able to stand up after that, I can't see how you'd give him 10 minutes and then let this continue and go up a scaffold. But the decisions that were made were made. I think a lot of fans felt negative about it. So we'll see how it is going forward. I think despite people's outrage, though, they will still watch AEW and stand behind the product. Oh, I think so. I think so. This is not a good night. Stop this one up as a loss. But that doesn't mean you can't come back and you can't learn from it either. No. Hikaru Shida versus Thunder Rosa was the next match. And I would say, I mean, it was the last match I saw. But it's arguably the best match I saw on the night. And it just had that weird spot of coming right after Hardy. I don't know if that affected my viewing of it. I think it was the only reason I stayed one more match because I was like, ooh, ladies match. I've been waiting for this. And I think yeah. Thunder Rosa had a good showing. Hikaru yeah. Shida, she defended that championship. May She may be the least interesting champion they've had yet, but I think Thunder Rosa really built her up with this match and gave her you know, kind of something to build on. This was kind of the best match they could have had for the NW, uh, for the women's title, having the NWA Women's Champion game in. I was well booked. I enjoyed the match. At the end of the day, you know, well, unfortunately, this is another thing. I didn't think it was a match, like, of a night. It wasn't, like, a crazy, like, blow-away match, but it was solid. And I think the problem with this show was we had a lot of negative things, and we had solid things. We didn't have, like, that one, like, back in Revolution where we had the Buck versus you know, Omega and the page and they tore it up. We just, we didn't have that to kind of balance out everything. We haven't made one blow away match. This pay-per-view could have been probably saved. And again, solid effort by the ladies. I'll give it a slight thumbs up, but it's not like, again, like, you know, yeah. super memorable. Now, I didn't see the rest of the card, so we had the uh, eight-man uh, tag match next. Okay. Actually, solid match. The crowd seemed to be into it. What was interesting about this was at basically towards the end, Brody Lee had set up the pin on I don't know if it was Marshall or 
Dustin. But basically, they were down. I think it was, it was Dustin. Because at, at the end of it, Dustin got the pin. But Brody was setting Cabana up to steal the pin. And Cabana decided to go for a moonsault. He missed. Gold Dust, Dustin Rose, rather, gets the pin. And Brody, for the first time, shows anger at Cabana. He's pushing him. He's like, what the hell? I had him. And he's yelling at him like he would yell at the other Dark Horse. So he kind of continued that storyline. What's even better, and that's kind of highlight for me, is Dustin in the back. Now they tell him that, you know, like, he's got a promo. We're going to do this for Cody. And we're not done. And it feels good to get a win. And then they tell him, well, we've just been informed by Tony Khan. You're fighting Brody Lee for the TNT title this Wednesday. And Dustin's like, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm fighting for a title. He's so believable. He's got a fire passing and promo. And he's saying, hey, you know, Brody, I'm coming for you. Hell, I'm coming with me. So be ready, pal. And it's like, it made me like, okay, I want to see that match. This was actually the pay-per-view highlight for me. Like, I bought into Dustin, and I was like, awesome. But I hope we get that. I don't know if they will, but it made me like, I don't for this guy. Yeah, and it's good to see that the Dark Order has really come together as a concept because they've been pushing that the whole time through this, yeah. through the creation of this company, and it didn't really hit till I'd say Brody Lee got there, and now I just think it's to another level. Next match is got to be my m moment of the night, even though I didn't see it. It's FTR winning the tag titles from Omega and Page. I'm gonna show you something here. I want to uh, get this from my boy, Mike Flynn. I think I have it. Yes, I do. This is good radio right here. You want to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you want to have everybody uh, waiting while you do this here. Uh. Yeah, yeah. Hold up, everybody. Hold the fuck up. Yeah, give me a laugh track. I love it. Sweetening with the... We got to sweeten our crowd noise in the empty arena. Let me see what this button does. I don't even know what the fuck is green. Oh, sad trumpet. That has got to get used more often. Trumpet. Uh, this whole show has not been good. Battle World was bad. It was not been good. Went too long. Tag title match. Way too long with no real crowd. And I think he had added something that basically that, you know, he like, oh, I love FTR, but they don't seem to be clicking in AEW with this style. That's what my point. I'm not going to 100% agree with what he's saying there. I love me some FTR. Obviously, he does too. He doesn't feel like they've clicked in his own words. However, I will say this. You know, when they talk about their time on the main roster and currently what they're doing now, there still has not been a match with FTR that has rivaled the match that they had with American Alpha and DIY. Those matches were so stellar, so great for tag team wrestling. We haven't seen anything like that yet. I love the FDR package. I think they're solid, but we just haven't had that great moment. We thought this would have been it, and it was nice to see them at the tag zone. However, with the crowd being kind of dead and whatever, for whatever reason, it just didn't seem like as good as it could have been. And I'm happy they got the belt, but I can't wait to see what the storyline is going to for those other matches, though, there was another great team in the ring with them making that happen. Is there another team in AEW that's up to the level of an American Alpha or a Gargano and Ciampa? The Bucks. I think that's still, we still need that match. That's and that's point. what we're building up to. And right. I mean, I wouldn't fault. I wouldn't fault FTR for the match. I would almost fault the division you have around them. There are a lot of good teams, but. There are a lot of good teams with a flippy, more acrobatic style. Not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that, but FTR, they just have a whole different style. They pattern themselves after Southern Wrestling, and that's not necessarily going to gel with every team. So I think that's hey, kind of what's thing. hurting them in AEW. Here's the thing. And would these matches be more dynamic in front of a hot crowd than they would more guaranteed have if we could have crowds? That's true. Maybe that's why they're holding on, holding out on FTR versus the Bucks till they can get a more full stadium and get the reaction that that match deserves, given how long I, I, it's been built up. I do want to add this before we go on to the next match, too. It was interesting to see the aftermath where basically Omega had accidentally need Hangman in the face. Hangman ends up taking the pin, but Omega is pissed off at Hangman now. And Hangman goes for the embrace. Kenny looks like he's going to hit him with part of the table. Doesn't hit him. 
But then Hangman goes to embrace him, and Kenny just turns away and lets him fall on the ground. Afterwards, Kenny's leaving. The Bucks are like, Kenny, what are we doing? And he's like, I'm not sticking around here. You guys can follow me or not. And the Bucks don't follow him, but you're left with just like wondering what's going on. It's so funny because Hangman kind of trips the Bucks. So it's kind of the heel move, but now here's Kenny kind of being the heel. There's a lot of shades of gray with this. It's very interesting, but I also, I'm also at the point now, as much as I love the tell of the story, I do kind of want to see it conclude, and I want to know who's the baby face heel. Yeah, and they, I mean, they are. that's a good storyline that they are running throughout the company. And another storyline that I think is up there is Jericho versus Orange Cassidy. And I'm not going to say I was surprised to hear that Cassidy won because, I mean, Jericho is just at a different level of his career. And it almost seems like he wants to take that chance to make the next yeah. guy. And, I mean, Cassidy has been over on the independents for a while. I don't think many people in the mainstream are necessarily fans yet or necessarily get it yet. Those that do love it, but those that don't hate it. And I think this match with Jericho is going to go a step in making him more legitimate. I thought that this had the crowd uh, reaction of the night. The crowd that was there seemed very as loud as they could be and were really into this. It wasn't a blow-away match or anything. I mean, it's kind of hard to do that in this kind of gimmicky match, but I enjoyed it actually. This one I didn't mind. I know I don't think Mike was a fan of this. I don't think he liked it. But I mean, it's kind of a weird match. Like, you know, like you're winning with in so it really kind of depends on your taste. I didn't hate this one. I actually thought this was fine. Yeah, I'll give it a slight thumbs up. This one this match I actually kinda of like Final match of the night, Moxley versus MJF. I was almost sure MJF was gonna win the title. It just seemed like he was having such a meteoric rise. They've been like they haven't oversaturated him on TV. His run in particular up to this event was spectacular on TV. Did you think this match still helped him even though he didn't win the title? Uh yeah, it definitely. I mean, he's so good. This match is doing it to hurt him. Uh, it was a good showcase for him. I thought he should have won the belt as well. I think he's such a hot character. However, once Lance Archer won the Casino Battle Royal. I didn't really see them book an Archer MJF kind of anytime soon, so I had my feelings that Mox was going to probably walk out with the belt. They did tease this essentially with Warlord again. Yeah, we'll see where everything goes. I love MJF. Hopefully this means down the road when he challenges for the belt again, and I believe he will, then they'll put the strap on him because I think he's the kind of guy and the kind of heel that can really turn uh, this company around and get him even like more on a hot streak. You know, not that they're doing right now, but I'm saying like, MJF's that kind of next level performer. So this event, I mean, a lot of people came out of it disappointed. It had its bright spots, but it also kind of showed a couple glaring weaknesses. Not weaknesses, but a kind of like a couple big negatives on AEW. Obviously, it's not going to affect whether you're going to watch this week, but how do you feel some of these things will be addressed on Dynamite, or will they even be addressed? First off, one bad show doesn't kill a company. We know that. So they'll be fine. If it did, WWE would have been done in what, 2016, 2017? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So one bad show don't kill nobody. That being said, yeah, we'll, we'll have to see if this gets addressed at all. And they, they usually come out and address things a lot of times, but I don't really know where you go from here. The Hardy stuff's already done. I think it's best just to move on learn from it. There was the other factor that got a little negative attention. My boy, Jim Ross, who I love, made a comment about Anna J. There was like a, he thought there might have been a wardrobe malfunction, and he made a comment, he goes, oh, does he have a wardrobe about what's going on over there? Or is that my wishful thinking? And then asked the first, he apologized, but he also told people, you know, it was a joke, it was poor tape, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, but also lighten up. Uh, yeah, we, a- we hear him do Blue Chew fucking commercials every week. Like, uh, it's kind of known that Jim Ross is not necessarily a dirty old man, but he's getting there. It's, uh, it's another error, but here's the thing. The New York Post picked up this story. So that's why that might be something we have to look out for. Hopefully, I don't want to see JR go, you know, under the rug because he made one little ill-time comment. I know people that don't like Jim will probably throw a bunch of other comments in great face, but I still love Jim. I think he contributed great to the show. They better not go off, go after fucking JRS BBQ. I mean, we got to have that honey mustard out there. His mama's signature ketchup. <laughs> don't don't attack our spice rack, fellas. <laughs> yeah, we have to be. <laughs> yeah, so we'll see what happens in the future. Overall, not the best show, but uh, I'm a positive person. Uh Hell, I still watch WWE events. That's how positive I am. So I'm definitely still believing in AEW. I'm pulling for him. 
Well, let's say somebody yeah, came up to you up. and said, like, I haven't bought the pay-per-view yet. Do you think I should buy it? Would you recommend them buying it? Or would you say save your money for the next show or something like that? Yeah, I would say save your money for the next show. I wouldn't tell them about this one, no. Okay, I mean, that's all you really need to know about it. And yeah. we're not dumping on AEW. This is just the first time we've been disappointed by them. So it, yeah. it's kind of a weird position to be. I mean, I still have high hopes for them. I'd love yeah. to see Matt Seidel continue with the company, but that was a rough bump. Both yeah. him and Matt Hardy, like, are these bumps that could end their careers? You know, or I make them... I don't think them... Seidel. You yeah, don't think Seidel's so? Seidel's fine. Yeah, actually, Randy, I was the one of the... He asked us if we thought Matt Hardy should retire. He thinks Matt should. He's beat up. I think they're still out. I think Matt's got some years left. So this wasn't a great thing to happen to him. But if he passed the concussion protocol now, a couple of days later after going to the hospital, which it appears he has, then I say he should be good to go still at some point. I don't know. That's actually pretty observant of Randy because I'm a Matt Hardy fan, but how many of these bad bumps does he take? You know, how beat up is he in general? Like, how many big bumps does he have left in him? Right. I mean, that's fair. I, I don't think he needs to retire at this point. But uh, if you're a huge Matt Hardy fan and he's had a great career, this wouldn't be a bad time for him to go out either. I'm not saying, you know what I mean? Like, if he went out tomorrow, I wouldn't be disappointed. If like, he oh, had... Matt, what if he had another bad incident like this? Would that change your mind? Or is it kind of, he's just kind of a victim of circumstance? Because when you take these big risks, there are those potential factors that could hurt you. Well, let me ask you this. What if John Moxley, John Moxley took a bad bump like this? I mean, you know, I mean, I don't know. Why are we judging this on harsh with the DLC bump? Yeah, just from his accumulated bumps over the years, and if you're talking about him possibly being too old for the game, and like, I mean, shit, would you wanna, would you wanna go off like almost like a cherry picker type thing and take a back bump through a table and bump your head on the ground? Like, right. I mean, granted, he's an about, athlete, but like that would put me about, out of work for a little bit. Yeah. How about this? I would say it is in Matt Hardy's best interest to maybe rethink his style as he continues his career, if he's going to continue his career. Yeah, it's not necessarily a Daniel Bryan thing where it's, like, life-threatening, but almost like he's accelerating that push to the line of where it could be life-threatening, depending on the bumps he takes. On well, that, note, that was AEW. It was... It was what it oh, was. what the fuck was that? That was not the button I wanted. All right. It, the only thing we got to say about AEW All Out was... <laughs> we're going to be getting so much more out of this soundboard when I figure out what these fucking buttons do. But, guys, thanks for joining us for the review this week, and we will talk to you again next week. All right, so that wraps us up for this week. Thank you again for listening to the Working Fans Podcast. So as always, you can find us on Twitter at Fans Working. Our Facebook page is Working Fans Wrestling Pod. We have email where you can reach out to us and let us know what you think also. That's Working Fans Wrestling Pod at gmail.com. Follow us on Instagram, Working Fans Wrestling underscore pod. And then as always, please continue to listen to us on Anchor.fm, Google Podcast, Spotify, Breaker, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, all your major platforms. If you're following us on Apple Podcasts, which we are also on now, and YouTube, please make sure you subscribe and give us a five-star rating. It helps us bring you these podcasts where we get to talk to you and talk with you every week.